But innovation shouldn't just be tethered exclusively to where you can get capital. And unfortunately, it's become increasingly so. Hello, hello. Hi there. How are you? Doing all right. How are you? Fantastic. Look, you have some uh, graffiti back there. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, I met a guy who was an old school LA writer, as they call themselves, and uh, did some pieces for the office, did a big mural, and I had him do a little panel for, the, for me to take home. So kind of fun. Looks authentic, eh? It definitely does. What's the theme? <laughs> Just creative inspiration or was there a specific theme to it? Uh, well, it actually says my last name, Suzuki, in, in kanji, right? Which is like the... Like, so I don't, I don't understand this very well. I, I should because I'm half Japanese. But there's the Japanese characters that are based on Chinese characters. And then there are the actual invented Japanese characters, which is something called... Uh, uh, something else, hiragana. I can't remember. And then, like, I, th there, there, there's this different combination, and they use them all, you know. And it's very complex. But um, the interesting thing is, this is just he doesn't use any special tips. He just uses the stock tip on the can and just has a technique and makes it perfect. You know, I don't. It's just amazing to me. It really is amazing. It looks really cool. You know, you see that the trains go by that are covered in this stuff. And it's like a rolling art museum these days. These guys do. It's just awesome. I like it when they'll be improving like a part of our town and they'll invite the people to come do some murals or something and make it look really cool. Uh, and I think that's I like that it gives a little when it's done professionally and like when it's welcomed and they have time to set up and do it right. It really can add some cool unique style to the to the community i agree i agree and it gets more respect right from the writers too they're they're not as inclined to do their own thing there because they you know it's already it's already nice so do you have a creative background um not really i'm incredibly uh you know kind of math and science oriented i've always i've been into music and uh you know, played trombone and baritone for years, band geek at heart, but you know, not 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 very not very creative myself. I appreciate it. I like the performing arts. I like visual art, but uh, I like what I like. But I'm not. I don't know. You? Me? I play a little music. I play a little bit of piano, guitar. Oh. Um, growing up, I was in marching band. I played yes. the alto saxophone all the way through middle school and into high school. Great. And yeah, so that was um, quite the experience. And uh, yeah, I like to geek out about everything. I love design. I'm not a designer, but when I see great design, I'm I'm just like, I'm so enamored by it. I'm like, this is just beautiful. Yeah, I guess I would say that I I... I... I am an observer, but I'm not a doer on the creative side, except except for music, where I I still I love jazz. I think it's just such a an amazing art form. I love to cook. You know, I think there's a lot of artistry in the cul culinary arts, as they as they call it. But I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, the technical execution plus doing all the things with flavors. <laughs> quite a quite an undertaking i don't have the palette for you know like for for that really detailed like taste and getting that nuance my wife can just taste every single note and say oh cardamom or something you know and i'm yeah tastes good <laughs> yeah i don't even know what that is so that shows how much i know <laughs> oh man no that that's exciting i'm when i was doing the prep for talking with you and by the way it's just real casual we just kind of like hang out the team ed edits it up, makes us sound way smarter than we are. Nice. But uh, when I was doing the prep, I got to see your background. And, you know, I do a lot of these interviews so I can kind of get a feel for different people. And when I saw your background with like skiing and like different outdoors activities. And I was just like, yep, I'm super excited for this conversation awesome. because, yeah, I've, I've just found that people who have rounded out other parts of their lives have filled up other parts of their lives. They just have this added flair of experience. Yeah, I definitely have lots of interests. You know, I think so much of the tech industry really 
idolizes the overachievers, you know, Elon and Gates and all these guys, but they kind of only do one thing. They just work, which is cool. Good. I mean, they're super passionate. They're super focused. One of the things I always admired about um, Paul Allen is he'd leave with that discussion. Like, I have lots of interest ripping guitar player, right? I don't know if you ever heard him play. There was 60 minutes. I never heard him until I saw that 60 minutes interview. And the guy is amazing and knew, knew all the guys that I really admired, you know, 80s, 80s rock stars and stuff. And um, so I, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, having that in terms of the life you live and uh you know the good things that follow but the guys that are super focused get a lot done there's no doubt about it yeah, i think in uh inside bill's mind on netflix that documentary i think it was that one but they briefly like alluded to the fact that paul allen went to pursue music or something of this sort yeah yeah i, I happen to live uh in the same town where uh he had his primary residence um and uh i know there's a lot of health stuff going on as well but i think i think that was a big part of it you know he he was always doing lots of different things and and he um after he left microsoft he started vulcan uh, which is of course a nod to like his sci-fi passion and all of that and uh and and you can see in that as well that that that's they they did a lot of things you know they did some kind of classic venture investing they did a ton of real estate stuff you know he bought the seahawks the trailblazer I mean, he was kind of all over the place um but in a good way in my opinion you know really really tried some some new things and um definitely left a positive mark in my opinion on seattle really really did a lot for for the town in a good way is that where you grew up no, I'm a I'm a Midwest kid, you know, which is kind of funny to say because I was actually born in Honolulu, Hawaii, but um, all my formative years were in rural Minnesota. So here I was, this half Asian kid, and what was then a very you know lily white, uh, very very rural setting. We were the big town, you know. Um, so I grew up, and the norm was you know, tractors going down the street regularly. It was not unusual. I grew up working summers doing farm jobs and that was how I made money, you know? And that sort of is where some of the work ethic came from, I think too, you know, and the respect for hard work and the respect for your time and others' time and just doing all the things that need to be done. There's a lot of jobs. I think it helps make you a better entrepreneur too, for that matter, you know, when you gotta pull the rocks out of the field so it doesn't, you know, damage the machine that goes and harvests the crops. It's it's just a, it's such a brutal manual labor job, but in order to see these beautiful crops grow that make these unbelievable yields happen, it just it gives you a little bit of a connection to, where stuff comes from and what it takes to get it done, you know? Yeah, I agree with that a lot. I find that we lack a lot of that because we have such little manual labor these days in our everyday lives, especially professionals. But I notice that I pick up this, this, this like winning edge of discipline at the gym because it's like, I have to put the weight up because I know if I put the weight up, I'll feel good. And so I go in there, I don't want to do it, but I know that I have to do it. And then once it's done, it feels great. And then you get better results and you're happier later when you're like looking in the mirror and life is just better uh, and, and you feel better and you sleep better. And so uh, you, you don't want to do it, but you have to do it. And so you get into this habit of you quit thinking about it. You just, you just go in there and do it. You're just like, I'm over, I'm over this forever internal monologue debate in my head. I'm just doing it. Totally agree. It's almost that decision of, you know, the, the best day to work out is the day you least want to work out. And when, when you kind of achieve that mental commitment or um, agreement or, uh, I don't know, you just resolve that that's the best way. Because when you see those results and positive things happen, then you have those kinds of outcomes. And everyone's, you know, feeling better about themselves, all the positives flow out of that. Then on the easy days, it's even easier. You're super stoked. And on the hard days, you know, that's what you're up against, right? I mean, that's a, I agree. 
that's a really rewarding thing. I don't, I don't think many people share that attitude. I think for a lot of people, it's really, really a struggle, you know, which is why the New Year's resolution and the big wave of enrollments in gyms uh, at the New Year is such a, such a thing, you know, it's funny to me. So I think they haven't crossed what I call the pain threshold. And that would be like, most people live their lives to try to avoid pain. Right. And they're not, they're not comfortable with it. They don't understand it. I'm very comfortable. I know exactly what maximum pain is and it's just the duration at which I'm going to stay there. <laughs> and then I decide to, to make sure I don't burn out. Cause I know what happens if you stay at maximum pain too long, but you know, you, you sort of yo-yo and even in small decisions, I think a lot of people can understand this is you'll yo-yo back and forth until the pain of yo-yoing is greater than the pain of just actually doing it. And that's like the threshold. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think people who don't get to this, you know, kind of breakthrough of, you know, I, if you're a committed cyclist, sometimes you ride in the rain and you go out when the weather's lousy because you want to be strong on the bike. And if you haven't done that enough to see it come back in the form of results of either having better fitness or being able to ride faster and longer or up a hill or so, or whatever, whatever that outcome is, the weight loss goal, whatever it might be. If you haven't had that achievement, boy, it can be really defeating, right? I think that's, that's maybe part of the, uh, the breakthrough. And there's a, <laughs> there's a great show. I think a highly underrated show on Amazon called pa the Patriot, not to be confused with the movie. I don't know if you've seen this, but they talk about the Van, T Van Tazner, danger meridian or something like this and it's this line you cross and once you cross that line all the rules change and i think it's it's a little bit like that with this the self-discipline and, and working out thing and yeah and i think it's important back to like the entrepreneur concept as well or building a company or being a leader within a company whether it's like mid-level manager or executive the people that are around you will subsequently make that harder or easier to achieve I agree. I completely agree. And if, if this is partly maybe where culture starts to come to bear as well, if you have leadership that all has experienced and, you know, lives that a little bit, they bring that to their teams, you know, and not everyone, not everyone's going to be that way. And that's okay. And, and there should be that kind of diversity of attitude and, and, and self-belief, I think to have the best teams, but when you have sort of that top down willingness to push through challenges, you have better outcomes invariably, invariably. And so we've, we've been fortunate in our business doings that initially by luck, we had enough people who were that way. I was that way, fortunately, you know, to, to the point of where, where the discussion started, but that we happen to have. And, and for everyone, it's not all just sort of the physical challenge either. It's not all, I'm going to torture myself in the gym. I'm going to torture myself on the bike or on the run. Uh, it, you know, it can come on in different, on different fronts and in different ways for some it's parenting, right? They're heroic parents, you know, or are them on the music side, right. Too, just getting the more and more complex execution of whatever a run on the piano or you know there's you can take it in any number of directions but you know it all comes back to commitment i think too yeah i mean i've found that one of the games of life <laughs> as i think about it is finding the thing i don't want to do and making myself do it <laughs> you know that's interesting joel because i'm kind of going the other way these days i'm trying to trying to find more of the things i want to do and doing more of those <laughs> but i know what you're saying <laughs> there's a time and a place it's not like i'm you know I, I, i'm weird though because <laughs> it's like when i'll eat my food i'll say all right which is the piece of food on the plate i want to eat the most and i'll eat that last yes yeah save the best I, for last i get that yeah i've just it's you know life is long right? And in, in one perspective, life is long. And so I, I play these little games to try to keep it interesting. And one of them is like micro improvements at discipline. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it goes back to the working out on the days you least want to, right? And, and always having that willingness and commitment to do it. And, and the more you do it, the less, the less hard it is. And so you got to find the next hardest thing that's going to get you what you want to achieve, right? On some level, it's about goals. And it sounds like for you, maybe the goal is 
to have fewer boundaries, right? Have fewer personal boundaries. You know, for me, it's become increasingly focused around the things I love. I've also found, and I don't know if you found this yourself, but the my life is getting so full of these hobbies and interests that if I add another one, the journey of that is so disruptive to the other things that I really love. And it's the gear and the carving out the time and the, you know, going and getting to do it and still having time to do the other things and still being able to, you know, show up at work and do a good job and be a good parent and, you know, keep, keep everything on track there. You know, sometimes the trade-offs become, become challenging along with getting enough sleep that, that you don't show up at the gym and push yourself and then ha have an injury that sets you back. And now you're having to reset, right? That's the other part of it. Is oh yeah. The, is we all go, we all experience the recklessness and, and then we learn that that's not a good place to be. <laughs> we learn that one real quick. Yeah. I, I fully agree, man. Yeah. It's, uh, I think that it's, it's, life has become for me what it is as a function of feeling motivated to not just follow the rules or not not just follow the playbook i guess i've always seen the goal line and thought how do i get there faster i tried uh I was, I, I love Minnesota and I have a lot of respect for Minnesotans and I love Minnesotans and um, don't sound like one much anymore, but um, I graduated from high school a year early. Cause I just, I just felt like I didn't need to do that much more. And, and, and I, it was painful and I, it probably was not the best idea, but I, I did it. And so then I started college early and I started taking these 300, 400 level classes like my second year, which was kind of also a mistake. But there were all these secondary learnings that came along with that, one of which was they're in an order for a reason, right? But uh, but as a result, it sort of just taught me that there you can you can push and achieve what you want your own way, do your own thing according to your own agenda, very much the Dave Grohl school of music, right? That never take a lesson. Don't take lessons, teach yourself, do it your way. I've, I've never taken a ski lesson in my life. Aside from, aside from the odd ski guide saying, oh, you know, you should try think about this. Um, I've never, I've never taken a ski lesson. I've been skiing for 35 years. I've skied all over the world on the biggest stuff you see in the movies. And it's, it's great. And I love it. It's my first passion. And just did it my own way and then, i mean as a result though too business has also suffered some of those those challenges and setbacks doing it my own way being so determined and emboldened self-emboldened that you know i'm just charging charging ahead with my head down and 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 not uh maybe slowing down enough to uh to learn and see that they're go the slow the slow way might be the fast way right as they say in avalanche recovery go slow to go fast and when you're rushing is when you make a mistake and that's the moments that could save a life so so there certainly is a degree of that but there's also evidence that that pushing the way we have is translated into into the success that we enjoy today in our business so yeah tell me a little bit about your current business the business we have exists because we had a customer and i think we we almost lost track of that so we started a, a consulting business in 2003 called browse consulting and it thrives and flourishes to this day and is a great business but we saw these trends emerging in technology virtualization um the, the notion of the cloud was still sort of abstract. Computing wasn't catching up, but virtualization was there and tangible. We were well-timed with it. We started thinking about automation. We we're like, all these things we can do. We got seduced by just kind of the, the nerd geek aspect of it and started going crazy. Initially, it was to serve our services customers, which are mostly big tech. And then saw this ability to turn and do it for all computer 
users from from the from the angle of IT. So what I mean is that in the same way that we were trying to distribute virtual machines in mass and automate their deployment, we saw we could do the same thing with any computer. And that IT, the need in IT was incredibly huge. And what we had to refine, and this is where we stubbed a toe, was matching our vision to the customer need. And this is the delicate art of product management, the dark art of product management, misunderstood art of product management. The imperative art of product management is saying, yes, our, our thesis was absolutely correct. People need to do this job. It has never been done well. And we have an opportunity to do it better. But, but rather than saying, we could take it so far and make it so magical. And we should, we should, in, in my classic fashion, look, look at what is possible and take it all the way to Mars when we haven't really been to the moon yet. Well, now, now, now we can think about Mars because we've been to the moon and we're going back to the moon and then that'll help us get to Mars even better. Well, that's, that's sort of what we had to dial back to is we did show that with our product it's called Smart Deploy, you can much more efficiently and much more easily and reliably do this really fundamental old job of deploying computers. And that we did indeed have the right idea doing it the modern way using cloud delivery as the means of doing that. The seduction was believing that we had to do it all in this vision of doing it in layers and this really overcomplicated, fully hosted, um, extremely resource intensive way. Customers didn't want that. They don't want complex. They, they're okay with complexity if it makes their job easier. It's not good if it makes it less reliable and more expensive. So we, we scaled back and took the modern approach, which is to do lots of iterations and, and come at it really objectively from an evidence gathering validation perspective. The other noise that entered the picture in that process was media and analysts and pressure from the industry that said, oh, you, you straight to Mars. That's how it's done. Yeah, that's how it's done if you're big tech and you can afford to you know, have, have these very, very, very large failures, right? Repeated very large failures. In Microsoft's case, a great example is Windows and these Windows variants not working. And they've just announced that they're going to not be taking 10x all the way. And this is the third one. So they, but they can afford to do it, right? Little startups really can't. And so the way that we would do it is to take what we know and stick, stay, make it pay, stick to your guns, believe in the evidence you have and the customers you have and what they're telling you and, and, and make them extremely happy and extremely successful. And then take the insight you have and add that next ingredient and get their reaction and the next ingredient and get the reaction. And it very much aligns to the way that dev's done now and the way that marketing's done now. This is, this is, this is the way, right? In the words of the Mandalorian. So it really, it really is an opportunity thinking about the, 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 the audience that might be listening to this. This can be applied to enterprise IT. Not only, not only hopefully that they get excited about our product and want to go check out Smart Deploy, but that there's an opportunity to change the way that IT is done by evaluating problems and looking for the best fitting solution and adding that and, 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 and iterating with a team, a department, a division, a branch office. And opening that up. That's what we're seeing with our largest customers is the way that they're adopting and the, and the most successful ones at that. It's, it's been, it's been, it's been super, super fascinating on every level. And to see also how, you know, and with respect, the analysts are wrong. 
they were wrong. We got bad guidance. We got, you know, encouraged the wrong way. And we initially believed them and charged full bore down this road that cost us a lot of time and money and was a great distraction. When we, if we just stayed really, really focused on what we knew to be the truth, we would have been, we would have been much farther ahead. And, as, and again, big tech can take that guidance, crochet it into all of their teams and doings and make it work for them. And then the outcome is, you know, uh, they, they get their, their mark in the leader quadrant on the magic quadrant or, or whatever the two by two is that the, the flavor of choice. And, and that really is not that that's a way for very large enterprise tech leaders to cover their butts and make sure that they don't jump off a cliff without kind of holding someone's hand. But that's not really how innovation is done. Innovation increasingly is happening from the bottom up, right? And it's more, it's more kind of these groundswell things, someone with a really good idea. The risk, of course, is someone's got a good idea, they make a right turn and go the wrong way, and then you're attached, and what do you do? And now we're kind of saddled to this cloud service. And so it's not, it's not as simple as maybe it seems, but I don't know. It's kind of complex. Yeah, I like one of the things I was pretty surprised about. Uh, after this podcast started to grow and I started to, to get invited to speak at different companies and executive teams and technology teams and things like that, I was so surprised about the amount of fear that exists in the corporate enterprise space. Like as you you mentioned a little bit, you know, analyst is sort of like you know do some research, but also as another a crutch or someone to hold on to to like revalidate the decision. Uh, I. You know, I've never been at enterprise level IT. I've just built technologies up to about, you know, teams of about 30 people and then sold them off. And so that's my experience professionally. Um, but man, I, I just go with my gut and look for objective evidence along the way and stay really, 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 really close to the customer and understand them. Like I can put, pick up my phone and I can call like my three top customers right now. And I know exactly what they're experiencing. I know their bosses' names. I know what how they report. I know everything about them. And that helps me really stay connected. Now I have a sales team and everything, but this helps me stay connected to exactly where the product needs to go. Yeah. So what is the phenomenon in the enterprise that drives the distance between IT and the customer, which is going to be their, their, the employees, employees, partners, you know I mean? There's a whole, there's a whole universe that it serves that has these, that introduces these problems, right. That introduces such inefficiency, especially in the largest enterprises have the worst problem with this. They've got all kinds of legacy infrastructure baggage. They've got cultural problems. They've got massive political challenges. And so they're just, they're just all, you know, my, 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 my sense is, and some evidence to support this is clinging to a buddy for, for dear life, for, for, um, career growth opportunities for career protection and so on. And so as a result, you know, there is, there's more of a protectionist mentality. And so then the enterprise architect ends up building something sort of disconnected from that and so that and, and then it goes off and it does all these iterations and when it comes back it lands and it's so far from what the customer needs that it's not adopted so then all this time effort energy is going to waste and the customer ends up doing the shadow it thing and they they got some off-the-shelf SaaS thing that they're going gangbusters with it's working but it's a huge no-no for many many good reasons security privacy you know, runaway cost problems, you know, et, et cetera. How, how do you reconcile this? And it's really a referendum. And this is a really great lesson for the up and comers who might be listening is if you can be cognizant of and bridge this gap that exists, that exactly this thing that we're talking about between the body of you let's users is sort of a four letter word right but let's it's it's generic enough that it applies to employees 
partners, suppliers, and maybe your customers that you provide services for, users. If you can, if you can drive some process that allows you to stay close enough to those people with your teams that are doing the creation of these tools and systems, you're going to get superior results. Those superior results will translate into personal results, whether it's career growth, uh, big wins for your teams, for your organization, more stock options, growth in stock price, whatever it is, this is, IT is everything now, and it will increasingly be so. And, and this becomes the game of the CTO, CIO, VP of tech, uh, you know, IT manager, even IT implementer, it goes all the way down, all the way down and all the way up. CEOs should heed this advice and say, what can I do from this role to bring these people together in this way that we don't have these things happening? Projects landing poorly, adoption failing, starting over. But we had the analysts tell us this was the way to go. So I'm cool. Yeah, yeah, your career is fine. But what, 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 what's happening now? The organization's being hampered. And then what happens? Things get, things get more tense and more tense and more tense. And you squeeze more and more efficiency out of it. And then quality problems. Quality problems on the manufacturing floor. Quality problems in security. And then you've got a ransomware attack. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy now, right? And that's what gives me anxiety and, and drives me to manage things the way that I do, right? Down, down this, this way that we're talking about. Also, the failures, of course, were very instructive too. But this, you know, the, the, the world being the way it is, is making it even more absolute in the necessity of being prudent and having heed and respect for the people and the process it's it's getting crazy man yeah i think you summed it up really well you said it is everything now i mean there's there's no business that it doesn't impact and digital transformation the much overused and abused <laughs> term man uh, but it is so much the way of things and even if you've done all the things we we have you know kind of done a lot of things rapidly and we committed to a very tightly integrated platform trade-offs trade-offs loosely coupled tightly coupled trade-offs both ways the potential of automation today is staggering it's unbelievable the risk of automation and, and, and sort of this house of cards is also daunting. Good process, good agile methodology, good scrum master, just heads up people who are all tuned in to what you're trying to do, make it sustainable. And what happens as a result of that sustainability is incredible speed. The risk in the middle of that is something going horribly wrong with one of your suppliers, with one of your vendors. If, if someone in the middle poses a risk to the way that you do things, that can be an unforeseen, you know, rug being pulled out from underneath you moment. So that's the other, the other place and way to be poised. But I guess it all comes back to a, a, a careful calculation of trade-offs and, and what those trade-offs are, right? And how much you empower people with autonomy versus you manage very tightly and carefully. And, and there are so, so many human implications, system implications, security implications that have to be balanced. And the answer is going to be really different for everyone. And it's just, you, you have to make a bunch of calculated bets at every turn. I mean, we're, we're, we're being very, very high level here, but I hope, I don't know. I hope this is, I like it. This is I'm fine with this. You know, <laughs> yeah. No, I first of all, I love it because I get it. And when people can speak in an abstracted way, what it does is it allows me to connect with them more because it gives me more flexibility to 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 stick that to my personal experiences, right? So I like it. Uh, I thought it was fascinating what you guys were doing, and one of the things that I that I couldn't answer for myself that I hope you could answer is. You know, what is the problem that people are experiencing or Googling 
where they find you as the solution? You know, the, the, the running joke is that the PC died, I think, five times. Right. And we always have to stop and, and count again. Now, which where are we? The the smartphone transformative, so useful. We're all addicted and use it nonstop because it's the source of so much. It's awesome. There's a huge problem with the phone, and that is input, even with voice, is not accurate enough to be fast enough to move and do all the things with enough power that we expect when we are in front of our keyboard and mouse on a large display. Tablet, similar problem. Um, similar problem, different level. Bigger display, easier to consume, more content, cool plays to, you know, the, the content houses and big tech content players, great. Doesn't solve the work problem. The PC is still the best solution, and it's it's going to remain so un until something there, there's another major major breakthrough. But the, it it just is so right. It's like a refrigerator, or like you know, it's like a micro. Well, it's not. It's it's like an oven. It's like an oven. You have your microwave. Microwave is great. It, and I I wrote a blog about this a while ago, or I, I can't remember. I talked about this a bunch. It, microwaves great. We all use them in addition to this wonderful conventional oven, electric or gas. And you have your preference depending on how much baking you do. And COVID, people are baking more. Awesome. Got a range on it. Maybe it's separate. You might have two ovens separate from your range. That's an, It's that important, right? The PC is very, very similar. Very similar. We address a very old job. And that is making PCs work the right way at work. Why is this challenging? It's challenging because of the configuration. It's challenging because of security. It's challenging because of big complex apps, even in the cloud age. It's made even more challenging because of the trends and phenomenon of mobile driving more sensors and ancillary devices and peripherals into that small package. So device diversity is multiplying, device complexity is increasing, but everyone turned their back on the poor PC to give attention to the rest of this kind of endpoint footprint, which is not imprudent. It was perfectly prudent. But this was a job that never got done right in the first place. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about sort of what we saw as a, as a unique opportunity to address this problem. People want to do this job well, and they can't. And so they either mobilize a very large team of experts, which is what the large enterprises do, or they outsource it. They outsource it to value-added resellers, the large value-added resellers, or to a managed service provider. And so the question is, they look for efficiencies, and especially post the Great Recession of 08, 09. The question is, how can we do more with less? I mean, the, the same, same sort of fundamental value conversation to business. And why the heck can't we just do this job ourselves? There's got to be a way. We're migrating to Windows 10. We're doing our every five-year hardware refresh approximately. We're moving to BYOD, adds new problems. Again, the multiplication of complexity. There's got to be a way to do this, an efficient way, a proper way. Not unlike the modern, awesome European-style vacuum that is unbelievably powerful, requires no bags, has low maintenance, and looks awesome. Isn't there something like that for the PC? There's got to be. That's, that's where we came in. And that's where, once we understood the way to talk about it, that if it's an answer for endpoint imaging, PC migration, hardware migration, that's, that's the key word that then pops and, and, and we go down this road that then reconverges on unified endpoint management 
IT service management, all these other broader topics that we're, that we're growing into, but growing into what we believe is the right way. So we don't self-obviate or turn into the product that everyone already hates. And that's the other problem. There's so many things out there that IT has learned to hate or that enterprise IT has adopted and gotten so entrenched in and their team of rarefied you know, uh, journeyman to master expert that anything new, these bottom-up solutions like we're talking about are a huge threat to them in their career. Had a conversation with a very, very large global beverage manufacturer. They were terrified. They're like, we're as efficient as we can be. There's no way. Our teams are awesome and they've got everything dialed what if your team could be a fifth or a tenth its size that's what's happening in education especially for our customers they're saying there's no way we can keep doing this now we have windows and chromebook and all this other stuff we can't spend more on it how does this team how do they how are these guys going to do it and 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 it's interesting because education's kind of decentralized enough that they're saying go figure it out just make it go. We don't have time. I don't have time to tell you how to do this. We don't have money to spend on the analysts. Figure it out. And they're coming back and saying, this, this is an unbelievable thing. Had a situation, great example. COVID, COVID example. Hospital goes and says, oh my gosh, we got to redo this. And so they go back to their old big box solution and hammering, 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 hit a wall, hammering, 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 can't work around the wall. What do we do? what the heck is this stood it up in four hours, you know, maxed out their trial, which of course, you know, we don't give people that much because in the early days, people were finishing their job on the trial. Shame on us. Uh, they, they asked, we, we gave them a green light. They did the entire hospital in a weekend in 40 hours, hundreds of endpoints, diverse platforms, you know, in, in a hospital environment where they're doing, imaging equipment and, you know, the scheduling people's PCs and, you know, the exam room PCs and all this stuff got done in a weekend. And so there are all kinds of nice, awesome, nerdy things that we've done at a really low level. There's all kinds of things that we're doing from a cloud perspective while still giving people their kind of comfortable, I can install a local admin console we're kind of the best of, of, of both worlds and heading in into this brave new world of the cloud the right way, the way that people want it. And so that's that's sort of the detailed color on 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 how this came to be and, 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 and why it's working in the way that it's going is the old job is not going away. And and in fact, current times, COVID, post-COVID times are making it even more important, putting more light on that, the necessity of that, the job and, and the remote worker, the modern way of the remote worker and remote IT for that matter, right? I would be, I would be very curious if, if listeners would, would generously give us some comments on how many of their teams are expecting to continue to work remotely part or maybe most or maybe all of the time post COVID. And the feedback we're hearing is there is an increasing expectation. Internally, there's an expectation that they'll have more latitude to do that, that it won't be just buns in seats at work in the lab doing the thing. Yeah, you gotta keep showing up and doing stuff, but how much of this really can be done remotely? And our answer is a lot of it. In fact, we think all of it. There's no reason it can't really be done. Someone has to go and receive devices when they're shipped a lot. But we now have a technique where we can drop ship from a, from a manufacturer and have you up and running, properly secured, fully updated work payload faster than your updates would take that come from your reseller or come from IT, for that matter, if it's being shipped to you. And it's just doing this the right, elegant, modern way. It's really that simple. Using cloud technologies, using 
there's some pretty actually pretty surprisingly old technologies for that matter that that people just didn't take the rest of the way they just didn't finish the job people deprioritize this partly because of the same thing that i argued earlier of the analyst said no it's gonna die the journalist said no it's dead of course the manufacturers were, were putting all the attention on smartphones and, and tablets and understandably they wanted to you know embolden that market and things so it, it's just a super fascinating it's it's vindicating it feels good to be right you know for once on a thing where i was like no i'm pretty sure for a long time i was like I, but all these people keep saying they got to have this stuff people keep showing up yeah but it's going to shrink and it's going to go away yeah you got customers today but they're going to go away Man, our renewal rates through the roof. We've got we've got enviable, awesome SaaS renewal rates. Our metrics are really, really strong. People love it. So it, it's it's comforting, I guess, Joel. Is what I would say. It feels good. I hey, look, I've stood in front of how many investors and they told me I'm crazy, and I'm like, my bank account keeps going up. It's been four years, and we double revenue every year. Well, yeah, but and I'm like. You guys just are looking for reasons not to invest. Right, but the market and yeah, I mean, and that's yeah. that's that's their job. You know, the, yeah. the other thing about about the investors is they have a model, right? They're playing into a model, and if it's not a moonshot, you know, they and and they they're looking for similar things. They're kind of they kind of have that jaded analyst streak to them too, right? They're they they've got a the table that they're betting on has to be just so, you know, in order for them to go in. And, and really go for it. And sometimes there are other mitigating factors, team, leadership, someone who's done it before. And, and now more than ever, I get that, right? Having, having made my run down Sand Hill Road and done the rounds up here with all the, all the, all the organizations, I, I totally understand. And I have respect for what, what those, those groups do. I have a respect for what, what PE firms do kind of more broadly. Um, But there's room for this, and there's room inside the enterprise. I would I would argue as well. Our technology, part of our technology, came from something that was assigned out of enterprise tech, and so there is opportunity again for our listeners to be exploring and feeling around for and experimenting and validating and growing internally these things that your organization will probably have a process for assigning intellectual property that you can decide, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll run this process, not necessarily expecting to do anything with it, but it's nice to have the option, right? It's a nice card to be able to play. And that's, that's a, that's a really powerful lever for maybe a director of operations who's eyeing a VP gig, who's working on some interesting stuff. There's a lot of interesting places and ways, especially right now, especially in environments where you're in the data swarm. That's the, there, there is so much to be done. There's much to be done on the endpoint, right? A lot. There's so much room. There's so much room to take this and even take, and I would argue as well, to do not unlike we've done, which is, uh, what Clay Christensen uh, adoringly coined the low end disruption, taking something, taking an old pride, an old job that has been over engineered and coming up with a simple solution that does the job better for the people who need to do the job most. And if you do that, you will have success. And we're a great example of that. Yeah. That's the feeling I get from uh, his, the Clay Christensen example you just gave, that's the feeling I got when browsing your website, figuring out, you know, trying to wrap my mind around what you guys do. There were a couple other products and I loved how you compared yourself to them. So for people who are listening, can you share what some of the other products are that they might be using? And if they're using these products, they should consider taking a look at Smart Deploy. Yeah, sure. So Altiris and Tivoli Endpoint Manager, Lots of people who have System Center, but use just a slice of it. We're, we're a great answer for a bunch of the endpoint component of that. 
uh, even like big fix customers and Tanium customers. There, there's a ton of that that we address and we do so with tremendous efficiency in, in a way that I think will be very delightful. And, and part of that delight comes in the fact that we respect your existing infrastructure. Most people have tremendous investments into cloud storage. Why are you paying two and three and five times for more and more cloud storage when you have terabytes and terabytes of it available to you? We make the most of that as an example. So it's, 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 easy, it's easy to get up and running. It's easy to crochet into uh, your infrastructure and it's easy to make less experienced people very, very successful and to execute the job that was tedious and unreliable and slow in reliable and speedy fashion. That's sort of the, the breakthrough moment, I think, is like the healthcare example where the expectation there'd be a long spin up, a ton of integration, and then a lot of babysitting turns into it's up, it's going, it works on that one. Yeah, it works on that one too. Looks like it's gonna work everywhere. Can we do them all and you're done? And that's that's sort of the, I think, the reason that we're having the retention and also sort of the feedback of this is unbelievable. Can you do this, too? And so we're having now sort of this growth moment where we're having to grow our engineering team and grow support to be able to not just help people be successful in more sophisticated and larger environments, but respond to feedback faster and faster and give people more of what they want to capitalize on the market opportunity super fascinating point to be at yeah it's exciting and we're only going to get more endpoints so being in yes. the endpoint management that, business is a good business <laughs> that is a fact endpoint is hot again and it's going faster and i think there's more clarity i think we're we're over the the seduction of the smartphone and the tablet and now things are normalizing and, and now there are all these other wonderful things that we're doing with our time and energy around AIML and Internet of Things and however we're, we're calling that universe. And the endpoint is becoming more generalized and we're focusing on data and, and securing and privacy and wrangling the edge. And that's where we're starting to spend more of our time is looking at all of the ingress and egress points and, and, and being attentive to that and helping people manage that at scale. Wrangling the edge sounds like a, an ad campaign. <laughs> right, maybe you're a punk rock band. Ooh, there you go. Either <laughs> one works. <laughs> oh man, this is great. I, I've got a leadership question for you. So as your tech teams grow and your business grows, um, I've been asking this fun hypothetical question this past week just to get some a variety of answers. But if you were to design like the perfect leadership program for your your first time tech managers, right? What would the most important concept in that program be? Astute and swift application of the scientific method. In 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 the fewest words is what I would say. In more words, it would be, well, it, it would have to also, I would add one more adjective, the humane application of, you know, the, the swift and thorough um, scientific method. I think that so much of the modern way, removing the human element, the modern way to do things well in the world is quick iteration and validation of a hypothesis. It really, uh, agile, lean agile scrum is just a way of doing science fast. Here's what we think, let's go prove it. Have your if thens, if it works, next step. If it doesn't, here's the alternative we try. Cool. I think the failure today in technology is in believing that it is acceptable to abuse people and treat people inhumanely because of the promise of explosive IPO, moonshot share price, options vesting, you know, the, the halo over my resume from having done my two-year penance at marquee company name that I believe 
there is a way to have your cake and eat it too handily you don't it doesn't require shouting matches it doesn't require over the top ego it doesn't require the the 996 you 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 you're familiar with this kind of tiktok culture 996 nine, 9 to 9 6 hours or 6 days a week um so a 72 hour work week being the norm that is in my belief the opposite of what it should be right it's it's really more about cultivating people will work harder if you cultivate an environment of mutual respect and if they really understand the process well they will get behind it and do what it takes which means sometimes there will not only be 72 hour weeks to so probably 100 hour weeks but people will see that and get behind their colleagues and say thanks for all this hard work you know you deserve you deserve this time off I'll, I'll, I'll defend the inbox, have fun in Hawaii. In fact, take, take three more days and we'll see you in a week and a half. And, and that's very much what we've tried to create. And I think we've been, we've been remarkably successful. And, and now it's coming back with people volunteering that back to us without me saying, Here, here's what we're trying to do. The, the flip side of that is there are abusers and, 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 and as you get larger, it's harder to kind of keep that, that going, but that, that it is, it is, it is equal parts in my opinion, humanity with high discipline and rigor and respect for this method that says, if we move with a great deal of urgency and a great deal of clarity on a clear problem, we will converge on a solution in a time frame that results in success that we're not aiming for failure failure really is not acceptable failure is a natural byproduct of trying right it goes it goes back to our earlier conversation about working out on rainy days working out when you least want to you're going to have horrible days at the gym you're going to have horrible days on the bike you are going to fall very hard on the ski hill when you least expect it and probably hurt yourself really badly and it's going to be embarrassing and you need to get up and get back on it and do what you need to do to get yourself back in shape and go. And it's the speed in which that can happen at business. Of course, you're generally at a lot less physical risk and more at reputation risk going back to the enterprise risk and more at, um, you know, risk of things getting bogged down in a political mechanism that drag out the time frame that makes the financial risk higher and puts puts you at an existential risk. That's your bigger risk. If you're attentive to customer and you're attentive to the problem, the hypothesis cl is clear, your team is unified, there is it is almost an unstoppable recipe for success, in my experience. It's like a uh... A mic drop moment. <laughs> Just drop the mic. <laughs> I love it. I, I want to be respectful of your time because we're coming up on the top of the hour. You did bring a little gift for people who are listening. They can get a free Smart Deploy Pro subscription. How do they do that? You bet. Go to go to smartdeploy.com. Uh, I think there will be a link e e uh, in, in, the, in the notes here for the podcast. And uh, listeners, you may not be the people who do this, but your your teams i think would be keenly interested if if you have computers this is probably of interest to you is, is my message free forever um a great way to start get a taste see how it works i we have thousands of people who will tell you it is probably worth the half day to take a look and and you know take advantage of it now download get an account going come back whenever We'll be here and uh, thrilled, thrilled to take you on the ride and, and thrilled to engage. We've got a great team of people who are very similar to me in attitude and mentality, and, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to unwind your most complex problems, um, be they at the end point or somewhere between you and the end point, which is more often the case to make sure uh, we get you going. But yeah, we're excited. We're super excited. I love it. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, your team had sent over that they're going to make smartdeploy.com forward slash modern CTO. Modern CTO. I wasn't sure it was modern CTO yeah. or MCTO. Awesome. Modern CTO. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. 